you for coming. Um, I am really happy to introduce today Lauren Scarpa um, from Brooks Scarpa uh, that's coming to lecture uh, at Syracuse. Uh, it's first time here. There you go. Do I need this? I need this. Uh, for, uh, he's going to be delivering the Dylan Back lecture for us this semester. Um, I'm going to try and introduce a little bit his work. Um, uh, the work of Lawrence Scarpa um, has redefined the role of the architect to produce some of the most remarkable and inspiring work today. Uh, Lawrence has garnered um, international claim uh, for the creative use of conventional material in unique and unexpected ways. Um, uh, he does this not by escaping the restrictions of practice, uh, but rather looking, questioning, and reworking the very process of designing and building. Um, as he himself describes it, making the ordinary extraordinary. Um, uh, Mr. Scarpa has received more than hundreds of major design awards, including 20 national AIA awards, uh, the 2014 Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, the 2005 Record Houses, the 2003 Record Interiors, the 2003 Radi Brunner Prize, uh, five AIA top 10 green buildings, and I can keep going uh, for a long time. Um, uh, in 2004, uh, the Architectural League of New York selected him as an emerging voice in architecture, and his work has been exhibited internationally, including the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., um, and he's also the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Awards for Interior Design Magazine and the AIA California Council. Um, he has taught at the university level for more than two decades um, and is currently at the faculty uh, at the University of South California in Los Angeles. Uh, prior to being at USC, he was also visiting professor at the Harvard GSD School of Design uh, University of Florida, University of Arkansas. He was the visiting professor at Washington University and the University of Michigan, and as well as the Friedman Fellow at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, he's a co-founder of Livable Places, uh, a non-profit development and public policy organization uh, dedicated to building mixed-use housing on underutilized and problematic parcels of land. Um, and most recently, he co-founded the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute uh, to help develop more sustainable and livable communities. So without prolonging this too, too much, please welcome me to, to help me welcome Lawrence Scarpa. Thank you. I, I have a mic here, so I think I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm not used to the cold weather. <laughs> when people come to LA, that's the first thing they always say. You know, their first comment, man, it's so beautiful, the weather. And I always tell them, well, don't get too excited. It's only like this about 330 days a year. <laughs> I'm gonna start by showing you a couple projects by two artists. On the right is a project by Andy Goldsworthy. On the left is an artist named Voth. Um, and when you look at their work, the first thing that you see is kind of this big, bold, like in your face form. It's like visually striking. But when you look further at each of the work, you begin to see something deeper unfold, something more than just to look at. Um, in the case of Voth, um, he draws this thing and documents the making. And Goldsworthy, you notice now this snowball, like just completely out of context. And both artists go to great lengths to document the making or the process of how they, they make the work. Um, in the case of 
Goldsworthy, the deconstruction, and Voth, the construction. So what you begin to see is an experience unfold that you didn't know. The project begins to turn into something uh, completely different. And you, the snowball, you know, turns to a pile of rocks and Voth takes this sarcophagus around these landscapes to tell you, you know, maybe a little bit about us. And in the end, for both artists, the object really doesn't matter. It's the um, experience that matters. And that's what we try to do with our work. We try to leave something behind, whether there's a building there or not. So some of you can probably, you know, even right now, think about a place that's special to you from childhood or maybe not even that long ago. And you can picture it in your mind so vivid and so clear. But then always when you go visit it, it looks completely different than you remember. Um, but the experience stays with you. And so we really try to, uh, the visual aspect of our work is important, but really it's the experience that matters to us. And I'll show you how this came about. And I think as young designers, it's always important to kind of uncover or learn what you do. And this didn't just happen magically that I thought about it, something that I discovered about myself. And this was one of the first projects I did when I came to Los Angeles. And we, I had no work, I didn't know anyone, and, but there were these uh, film directors who had money. They had, they didn't, they had, were interested in design, but they did not have any time. Uh, and so they would have these big deals with studio. They were like, almost like sports free agents where, you know, they could command a lot of money, um, but, you know, they would make partnerships with big studios and they said, would say, go have your own studio. You be the creative guy. We'll do all the management, but we want you working in 15 weeks. And so they would scramble to try and rent the place and build a studio. And that's kind of where I came in. So I was, I think, the only guy in town that would say, yes, I'll design it. And yes, I will guarantee you move in in 15 weeks. So what I'm going to show you are projects that were done basically in your semester. Okay, except that we just, we not only designed them, but we built them <laughs> as well. And so one of the first ones was this project. Um, and I would carry this little ad around in my pocket that was in the sports page every day about these shipping containers you could buy for nothing. And I wasn't too interested in the shipping container itself. Um, I was more interested in the story within those containers. So if you go down to Long Beach, there are thousands of them there, just sitting there. And what it talks about is kind of this transfer of goods from east to west, our trade imbalance, and a whole array of things that are embedded. There's a story already embedded in that container, and I would think what Venturi said when he said that a familiar thing seen in an unfamiliar way becomes both perceptually old and new at the same time. So, um, you know, we went down to the yard, we bought that container, and um, we started. We basically, what I'm showing you here are our design drawings, our client presentation drawings, and our construction drawings. Um, these, this was all done freehand on 11 by 17 paper, and we literally just faxed it to the job site. So um, you can see my drawing there and the final product. And what I discovered in this process is that the drawing, the building for us really became a drawing at full scale. And, you know, the contractor, the builder would say, 
oh, that beam you designed, I can't get it. These are the beams I can get. We would have to redesign it. It's almost like erasing the paper or deleting a line on the computer. And, you know, in the end, I thought we did something that was pretty incredible um, given time, a budget, and everything. And, and it opened my way of thinking about how I might practice architecture. And um, it made me think back to a time when I, I lived in New York and I, I worked for Paul Rudolph and my colleagues dragged me out to this place. It's closer to Albany than here. It's called Opus 40, um, done by that artist that you see um, on the right, Harvey Fight. And Harvey Fight bought this abandoned bluestone quarry and, you know, with the intent, hey, you know, I've got like unlimited bluestone to make my sculptures. And what he wound up doing was creating this place that's just magical. You know, if you get a chance to visit it, it's so beautiful. Way, way better than any sculpture he ever made. Um, and he worked on it for 40 years. But what was so intriguing is that he had a preconception about what he was going to do, but his life changed and he did something completely different and so much better by sort of venturing into the unknown or having that ability to let things come to him more naturally than to kind of have like a plan like architects do. Um, so I looked at other sculptors, uh, people like Henry Moore. Um, this is a drawing of his. And what they would do was not actually make a drawing of their sculpture, but they would make drawings about it it would become a frame of reference for how they were gonna approach their work and not a physical or an actual drawing of what it was gonna look like. And that was really intriguing to me and I started to think, you know, can I practice architect more like a sculptor? Um, to have that kind of freedom to think like that and at the same time not get sued and make things come in on budget and all the things we're stuck with as architects. Um, so what I did was I do what I usually do when I have ideas, I test them with you guys, with students. So I did a little summer class at Woodbury. This is a project for one of my clients that um, we built with uh, eight students, eight undergraduate students in six weeks for $3,000, okay, no drawings. What we did do is we spent the first week kind of, you know, everyone had their own ideas and we let the free association happen, which included models and other things. And then as a group, we discussed those and we decided on a set of principles and we started building. Um, this is for a nonprofit group called Venice Community Housing, and Venice Community Housing has a program that helps inner city kids that haven't received even a high school diploma, don't have driver's license, former drug addicts. They teach them a construction trade. So they have people working to build this with my students. And so the whole experience of putting college level smart kids with people who never even finished high school was a great learning experience for each of them. And they built this project which, you know, I thought was a pretty remarkable project. Um, no drawings, really fast and really expensive. You know, and some of the things here, like this picture on the lower right, one student took this, um, you know, carpet tiles, and he just turned it upside down. And there was, he, he, by doing so, you get this really soft, spongy, you know, durable surface. And, and those things you don't, you don't get unless you touch your work. Um, and so I was convinced that there was another way for me to practice. And I sort of fundamentally changed 
how I practice at that point. And so we still operate this way today. And I like to say we work in parallel universes. So I have clients that come in and we do projects, but we also have projects that we make up. Um, and those projects that we make up are just ideas that we follow. They don't have a beginning. They don't have an end. Some find their way into buildings and some just peter out. So, you know, this was one where I got really interested in, in our perception of wood. And, you know, generally we think of wood as a, like a tree or a building stud. There's almost no in between. And I was trying to capture that moment where the two coexist, you know, where in a sense it's organic and inert. And so we just made models. We were trying to broadcast light through thick and thin wood. We made little mockettes, computer models. It had, we just let it go. Um, so we wound up, you know, with the CNC machine um, and then doing computer models in a spot where we started to call this liquid wood. And it was about this time, one of my uh, staff that was working on this, he handed me a piece of paper for a uh, sculpture competition uh, to go in uh, a park in Santa Monica. So we decided to enter it. And I made this little sketch and said, this is a park bench. And uh, we got selected. Um, now I had to actually build it uh, for their price on top of it. And uh, when I went in, they really loved the idea, but they said, but how is that a bench, you know? And how do people sit on it? Um, and I told them, I said, look, have you ever been really comfortable in a chair that's always 16 inches high? People don't, they, they lean against things, they, they sit low, they lay, there are all kinds of configurations in a park. And it took me a while to convince them that this is a viable solution for a park bench. So, you know, we basically started to draw and make models. Again, just, I'm just showing you a few things as a way to just like Henry Moore would do to get us in the kind of frame of reference to start making it. And we started making it. And it's, you know, a series of uh, typical uh, micro lamb beams that we sculpted and we glued them together and this is it in the park. And, um, you know, I've gone back now over the years to just look and see what happens in the park because the city has told me like this is their most successful piece in the park. And if you look, you know, what's happened, a whole array of people like use this. It's the only bench in the park that actually people use, you know, which is the irony. And to me, it's art. Um, and I like the fact that people engage with the art. It's not something to look at. It's something that they use, that they touch. And I started to think about that notion of touch and how powerful that is when you touch something. So, you know, our exercise kept going with the wood and I started to think more about basically touching the building. And we had a commission come along to remodel a Frank Geary building that was built in 1963 for an edit company. And um, we, we just started making things. And so we made, it had a whole series of edit studios and we started constructing the, a wall the entire length of the project. Now this is a guy who had a five axis CNC machine doing drawer boxes. So I would just go to vendors because what I was finding with contractors is we'd show them these ideas and they'd look at it and go, ooh, that's going to be expensive. And they just take their last job that was expensive and they go, just triple that price and we'll make it work. You know, my client would freak out. 
I can't spend that kind of money. So I started going right to the people who make it. And they were so excited to see something new. And so we worked with them. We, we had parallel construction zones happening. And that's why we could do this so quickly. We were building in two spots. And these people were excited. And then, you know, we, they would build it in their shop, um, mock it up, number it send it to the job site with numbers on it and all the contractor had to do was follow the numbers. So this is it um, in place and those are edit studios. You can kind of see the crack up there. That's a door. Uh, my client loves it because he tells his clients go to studio number two, you know, and he points at the wall and they just look at it funny, you know, but they feel their way in. And every single person who goes here touches the wall, you know? And I've done many edit studios now, and they, the people always tell me, oh, you're the guy who did the one with the wood wall. They don't know the name of it. They don't remember where it is, but they've touched the wood wall. And I think that's powerful. Um, and that's, you remember that when you engage with the work and not just look at it. So we have an office full of these things that we make. And what tends to happen is we'll have clients come in and they see them um, sitting around like this little mockette, which really wound up having little to do with our wood study, but it was something we made. And uh, the one client says, you know, can I have one of those? And, uh, you know, I thought to myself, well, I, I guess we could do something. And uh, we did a, a space for them. They do prop placement. Um, they give away merchandise to celebrities and hope they get their picture taken with wearing their products. So they needed a dressing room. So I said, I think we can turn that into a dressing room. So uh, we just started building it full scale. Um, and I got to this point. Um, and I had no idea how to skin this thing. Um, it doesn't work very well as a dressing room like that. Um, and my client started calling me because they were close to moving in. And, uh, you know, says, what are we doing with it? I don't see any thing. What's the covering going to be like? And I just didn't know. Um, and I was trying to figure it out, but I was just at a loss. And I was about to fess up to my client and tell him, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and I was driving home thinking about how I'm going to tell this to my client. And right at the end of my block, the guy who fixes my old Volvo, William B. Leaf III, you know, I go there all the time because my car was always broken down. And for the first time ever, I see this sign on his building. It says, we'll shrink wrap anything. And I pulled in, you know, I'm like, I'm like, William, you shrink wrap? I had no idea. And he started laying it on me. You know, I shrink wrap boats for the military. You know, it was like, so I ran back to my office right then and there. I got this mock it's about this tall and I asked him to shrink wrap it. You know, so I came back in a couple days he was a lot more humble when I came back. Um, it didn't work very well. And uh, so I talked to him. And after about an hour conversation, I began to understand the problems we had. And um, I convinced him that he could do it. And so we modified this, brought it to the space. And there's William doing the shrink wrap. We, we changed it so he could work in a bit like a, pit on a, a pig on a spit. Um, while he did it, and, and this is the final product. And again, this is something you can't really draw. You know, you can't predict it. It's part of kind of the making or the touching. And, and you know, they're, they're, the, the tools are there for us always, even in today's world, to engage with the work. So we're, we're constantly looking not just for ideas, but for people and, and ways to do things. 
And we don't necessarily try to invent. We just try to uncover what's already there in maybe a different way to reveal um, something that we already know is there. So this is another one, a guy who has this equipment that can bend steel any way you want it. So um, we started making these boardrooms, another 15 week project, it's a 20,000 square foot building. Um, but I also wanted to, you know, everyone hates plaster or stucco, including me. Um, but I was determined to find something beautiful about it. So we basically rolled all this rebar and we formed these conference rooms and we plastered through the lath. And so the plaster actually oozed through the lath, lath and it became like a bit of a carpet. Um, and, you know, we know this is what the inside of a wall looks like. It's nothing new. I equate it a bit to psychoanalysis where, you know, we know it's there, we're just revealing it. And so you get these, the contrast between the smooth and the rough. And again, the same thing, everyone who walks in here, the first thing they do is they go up and they touch it. So what I begin to understand is that, you know, there's, there's really a fine line between the peculiar and the beautiful. Um, there's very little difference, I believe, between fine art and popular culture. And I'm interested in that moment where those two co-mingle. Uh, I'm interested in being both the teacher and the student and trying to find the ordinary within the ordinary. So I'm gonna show you a few other things we've done. Um, this is an affordable housing project made with recycled uh, cans. Uh, we had a local recycle company uh, crush those blocks um, for us. Um, it's really interesting too, you know, I get this too with my students. Contractors told me that architects stop by the job site and they ask them where they can buy these cans, like it's coming out of a sweets catalog or something. Um, a building, uh, this thermal screen made from um, industrial broom technology. You know, and this is kind of what we do. I go to the hardware store, we buy the brooms, we try to make things with them, and then we call people um, and talk to them. So this guy, I think we made, you know, maybe 60 calls to him about how he makes brooms and everything. And um, I think he sensed industrial espionage, you know? So he's like, why is this architect calling me all the time? Um, so he came to our office, you know, to see what we were doing. And, uh, you know, um, he said, well, you don't have to buy those brooms. I can." run these things, you know, 60 feet. And so I asked them questions that my client asked me, you know, I, I said, well, isn't it gonna get dirty? And he's like, oh no, we have, you know, material that won't collect dust or anything. And I just regurgitate that back to my client and they think I'm a genius, <laughs> you know? So you just, you know, you learn not by just trying to do everything yourself, you really, you know, I find our projects get better the more we work with other people. Um, this is a store we just finished in downtown um, LA in the fashion district. And you know, I walked around and they're like, this is what the streets look like. And you find these uh, bolts from the fabric, the cardboard tubes, they just throw them out. You know, so I went around <clears throat> and asked people to save them for me. And so we made a whole store out of them. Um, for this for Aesop. Um, even the light fixtures, the shelving, all made basically out of paper. The fire department loved us. <laughs> Cabinets, the light fixtures, the whole thing. But you know, again, you the know, same so thing. Every person who goes in the store puts that. their hands on the building. And here you can kind of see it overall and in the space. Um, this was my first corporate client 
Um, uh, they're an ad agency in, in LA. And, um, you know, when I walked the, the site with him, I was both elated and nervous. Uh, big project for us, but tons of offices, you know, something that just goes against my very being, closing everything up. So I started, I had this idea of maybe we make these uh, solar ecliptors in the office and really bring forth the light. Um, and as I walked the site with my client, he kept asking me, you know, what am I thinking? What are my ideas? And I didn't want to quite tell him because I was afraid I would, you know, get fired from my first corporate job, but he got it out of me, you know, and I said, I'm thinking Dixie Cups. And he said, you are not putting Dixie Cups in my space. So I went back to the office. We made that mock-up you see there on the left, and I emailed it to him, and I get the email back with the capital wow and the exc exclamation points, and uh, he's like, what is it? And I sent him back. I said, Dixie Cups. <laughs> so we did it, and this is it finished and you know again I stop by here from time to time I go in there one day it's all blue cups another day it's all green cups he's got lines of cups and everything the guy who didn't want Dixie cups is now playing with our building that's fantastic you know um, ping pong balls you know haven't done many edit stu edit studios in the time every editor would tell me they don't want light in their studio, which is so weird. Why wouldn't you want light in your space to work? And they're in there for 12, 14 hours, no light. Um, you know, what they told me was they can't stand glare on their screen. So in, you know, the studies we were doing, I found that the ping pong balls let light through the ball and also through the gaps to produce this kind of no glare, but a uniform kind of pixelation. And so we made mock-ups to show them, and then we did studios filled with natural light. And um, here you can kind of see what it looks like in the space. And when people come in, they see the light, but then when they get close and they see the ping pong balls, it's something familiar, something they can relate to. It heightens their whole experience. And so I'm always looking, and I try to look not beyond and not we don't invent anything um, we just try to reveal what we already know is there and so like in this case I was going you know five o'clock for my in the morning for my Starbucks coffee and they're painting this bus shelter you know and they're like look at that's amazing the light of that so that was what we started doing looking at light looking at how it how light broadcasts through color and different materials till we started making things. Um, and no client, uh, we just started making them. And I got enamored with this little drawing we were doing on the bottom because we had these one eighth inch acrylics that you can buy from the hardware store. They come in thousands of colors and there's not one nice color in all thousand of them. So we just started stacking them to make a color. And what I found is kind of the richness that you would get through the stacking or the depth and the light quality that came through it. So, you know, we just put it in that building that we were under construction on um, and we put skylights in the offices and backlit them so that the light um, would return like into the building. And, you know, I began to s discover this idea of light, but not how like um, light hits a building, but how you see light. And so we also incorporate that in our work. It's is the, the light. This is a school we just finished. But it's the light is actually coming through from the back, and 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 it's you're receiving the light. You're not looking at it reflecting off the building, and you get that depth. And so again, it's trying in some way to make the light visible. And I may have learned this, you know, at my time when Paul Rudolph, where he used to always describe 
you know, when he would do these skylights with the light coming through, he would say that the light was coming in while the space was escaping. And in some ways, and he would do these drawings of, of he would try to draw things you couldn't see. Um, and they're beautiful drawings if you ever get a chance to look at them. And in some ways, we're trying to do that with the light, is to capture the light or make the light visible. Um, and so um, this is just a charter high school, another building, the same idea, um, where the building can not just accept the light, but return it to the people. This is a building in Monterey, Mexico. It's a fairly large office building. And um, you can see how the light comes through the skin of the building and the reflection uh, basically enters the building. Um, and it's these things too for us are, you know, and I'll talk about this in a minute, they're not just for their perceptual or aesthetic value, they're also performative. Um, but, you know, what I've become more interested in is, uh, like, what makes things beautiful or what makes things intriguing? This is, um, on the left is a market in Mexico City, and on the right is a, a picture I took of the tourist attractions when you land at Orlando Airport, you know? And if you pick out any one of those things, they're, they're, there's nothing extraordinary about them, but the aggregation of them is quite beautiful to me. And so I began beginning to think, how does something that simple, you know, like just a tarp or an ugly uh, brochure for, you know, a, a tourist attraction become so beautiful? And I found these ladies in probably one of the poorest areas in our country in southwest um, Alabama called G's Bend. And they're, they're, the whole community makes these uh, quilts and none of them are trained as designers. Um, but they produce these remarkable, um, remarkable quilts and they've now become quite famous. Um, and with no training at all. And, you know, I asked myself, how can I be that good and that loose? And we just, as architects, for some reason, always have these great ideas. And then as soon as we put them down, we stiffen up, you know? And it never comes out like that. It never comes out natural. It's hard to flow. So, you know, I, I look at how can I make a, you know, can I make a building or something that flows that simple or that's easy? And um, we were commissioned for a uh, sculpture in front of a city hall in Pembroke Pines, Florida. And I started to think about that idea of light, but also at the same time, um, can I make this or in, in such a way like they made the quilts? So we just wrote the script um, to try to let the building design itself. You know, we made some parts, um, we put all the parts together and we just had some variables where we would move things and then kind of look at it how it kind of made itself. So we kind of picked one. We sent all those components out to prefab. It was made in Denver and then uh, put in place. So, you know, I, I keep thinking too, you know, and I guess maybe this just comes with, with time is like, my work is trying to be m more reduced. Um, and I look at that, to me, is really quite beautiful. You can see the kind of vertical lines, but the slight shift makes it really interesting. So I think, can I make a building that's made out of one part, like one thing only? And so we've done things where we've tried to do that by taking a component and just shifting it in this case, it's another school. It's got 650 solar panels built into the south facade. Um, it's basically a net zero school. But the idea 
that you could just repeat these panels and then just make a shift or an omission uh, for a window. And the windows come to the surface but are also behind, and so you get like a slight color shift. Um, and as a result, you get, I think, a moderately successful uh, building. But I think we've gotten, be gotten better at it, and we continue to get, get better um, by introducing, you know, this idea of movement. Like, I think it's all about, you know, the, the stat it's static, but it appears to move. So I would look again at other artists. This is an artist uh, named Patrick Hughes. He's a British artist who, who's done these paintings, which he, he calls prospectivity. And the paintings don't move, but the way he has shaped the canvas and the position of the viewer, it, they appear to move. And so, when I you know, we, we got a housing project and I but wanted to try to accomplish this shape here. Um, something like it... this. So we worked with a, a big company called C.R. Lawrence. They're, they, they make a lot of building products. Any architects in the room, I'm sure, have specified some of their products. Um, but they made this shutter for us. And we work with them and refine. It's a single shutter. Um, once we got to something that worked for us and we liked, we put them over the entire building. And so on this building, it's on a busy street in Los Angeles uh, with great views facing east and west. Terrible for, you know, thermal conditions. Terrible for people looking in the building, but beautiful views downtown and to the ocean. So, you know, the shutter kind of <laughs> mitigates a lot of that. It allows you to be private when you want, open when you want, cool when you want, or hot where you want. So the building, in a sense, gets redesigned by the occupants every day or every hour. So it's ever-changing um, the building through just the single component. And it's quite simple, you know, wrapper around the whole building. You can see it's just got a small porch and applied everywhere around it. So, you know, when we were doing this with this idea, we got the costing and our client, you know, it was about $300,000 to do all of this. And our client looked at it and go, oh, we could save a lot of money here. You know, um, maybe we should just take it off, you know? And I told them, okay, take it off. So they had the contractor remove it and, um, you know, save $300,000. And, you know, our uh, mechanical engineer said, well, hold on, wait a minute here. Um, we're going to get a lot more heat gain now. Um, we need to change the mechanical system, okay? 200 grand added right there, okay? Then, you know, there were other things. We had to change out all the windows because they were no longer protected. Another 50 grand. Okay, so at the end of the day, the client goes, you mean I'm getting all that for only $50,000 more? You know, it's like, I'd be crazy not to do it. So it, for us, it becomes a winning way. If you, if you look at it as a performative piece, not just aesthetic, but it becomes multivalent, it's always a winner. If it's just for the way it looks, it's 90% a loser. Um, so you get these beautiful light-filled spaces. And we had some fun on the interiors. Those are the kitchen back backsplashes. We've got a whole bunch of old skateboards. We cut them up and recycled them to make them the backsplashes in the kitchen. Um, and our work is we're getting larger projects. We're being challenged more, you know. So a lot of the things I show you, um, you know, some of you might be saying, well, that's easy when it's small. Well, it's easier. But as you get, we get larger work, it's, you know, I think it's great. It's a new challenge. So we're working on this, um, it's a 500 unit housing project in um, downtown LA. And um, <clears throat> the, um, the units, you know, when people do housing, they a lot of times know what they're going to do, the developers with the units. And so we say, how can we make a good building with that? And, you know, really we just take, took in this case the edges of the building. 
Instead of it just being a slab that's flat, we looked at what we could do um, with the edges um, and we basically started to make this sort of origami that could change with the building and you get you know this really um, interesting facade that again feels like it's moving and really feels quite complex but it's again quite simple of an idea. Um, the same idea we're now doing on a, a mixed-use project in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, and, you know, they often look expensive, but they don't, they're not, they're not nearly as expensive as the contractors and our clients see that they are, or that appears to them. So we've developed these kind of strategies to rationalize um, our work. Um, and make them into components um, that can be more easily understood, but also allow us design flexibility. This is a variation on the same thing that I just showed you for a different um, high-rise project that we're working on uh, uh, in downtown LA as well. So it's 350 units. Uh, we're redoing the flower market. It's an existing building. And so you get, you know, this kind of sculptural facade, but when you look at it from the other direction, it completely changes. Um, and this is a, a rehab, a partly and part new building. Um, we just finished this project um, in sh just outside of Chicago. Um, it's that little house behind the white car. We tore that down. Um, my client saw a project we did, it was a steel house, and he wanted a steel house. And he, he said he wanted his neighbors to hate him. You know. um, I wanted to do a brick house. Um, so we discussed that, I, I guess I won that argument. We did a bit brick house. Um, but you know, he was thinking that brick on the front you know, the beautiful red brick. I was actually thinking the brick on the side, what's known as uh, Chicago common brick, which is the garbage brick. You know, they put it on the side so no one can see it, and they put all the good brick on the front. I said, why don't we make your building out of Chicago common brick? He's like, but that is ugly. You know, no one really likes that. Um, but, you know, we got to a point where we both agreed on that. And I started looking at the brick and I liked that brick much better than when it was like perfect uh, and organized. You know, and it's like the same like this, the stack of books, if it was straight neat, you know, the vertical lines are there, but it's the shift that I think makes it really beautiful. And so we started drawing brick, or we would write some scripts to draw brick. Um, and this is simply looking at, in a way, how the brick might move or appear to, or to get that sense of motion a lot like I showed you with how Patrick used did it. And so we would, you know, make drawings, more, lots of drawings of brick, and then build models. Um, and um, you don't get it just by kind of looking at it. So I figured out that we have to actually do these animations to describe it because you see the building actually goes from solid to void and void to solid as you, as you move by it. Um, and we you know, would try to make these drawings to explain to the contractors and builders how to do it. And we always still have a little bit of kind of hesitation right out of the gate, but once we show them that it's really quite rational and not so hard, we get a lot of excitement from the people who make it, like this Mason, who at first refused to do it, was like saying, you know, hey, why don't we do this? He would start, you know, doing brick his own way, and I would just be like, can you just stick to the plan, please? <laughs> so away we went, we made it. They're, you know, columns of brick, here they are, they're self-supporting. The, the tube literally just holds it lateral, laterally, 
um, but it's a typical gravity load, and here it is. Uh, and like the project I showed you before, the light comes through from behind, right? So this is the light. You're receiving the light or the light becomes visual. This is not uh, a Photoshop or anything. This is how it looks. And, and the, when the light comes, the building moves even more. And so my client, who's been in the house now for a couple months, um, he's told me that people stop in front of his house, but they stop and then they back their car up. And then they pull it forward, you know, and back up. And it's like, he's like, I think they're trying to look through, you know. And I told him, I, I think they're trying to figure out if your building's moving or not, you know. So you might just put a stake out there that says, no, the building does not move. <laughs> I'm not going to show you the whole building. This will be in Architect Magazine next month. But uh, again, you can kind of get a sense of the space um, and the courtyard that's behind it. And that's our owner, Robert. Um, we just um, finished this project, or the design of it. This is. Uh, about 550 units of mixed-use housing in China, and it's the exact same idea I just showed you on mega scale. So these panels are, it's one panel, the exact shape and size over the whole building. And we've kind of made these columns that move around the building to get you kind of a building that as you move, the building kind of appears to levitate in a way. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can, like, make a building with, get the most out of the most reduced down components of a building. And I find that I really like these things which are simple, but that they have, like, slippage. And it's like the accident that, that appeals to me. This is a diagram of a uh, airport flight path and you know they have get the pilots given the same coordinates when they leave left or right but every pilot you know takes a different path and that is really intriguing to me that how a user affects what they do and like how a user can affect the building. And so we try to build in something where we can have um, a moment happen that's not entirely planned. Um, you know, so I started to think of that, of the idea of a line. That's, and, you know, when I would describe this to my mother, she pulled out this drawing I did as a, as a kid with a spirograph. I know some of you probably remember a spirograph for those of you who are younger you you don't but you stick your pen in this like gear and you just spin it around in a circle and it's a line this is like a 10 year old kid that made this drawing you know it's spectacular um, and you know without even trying um, so you know it's it's I thought about the power like of the line and like the pickup sticks in the box are boring when you roll them out, they're mesmerizing, you know, how they land and how you can pick them apart. So I started to think of what you can do with a line. And through this idea of ruled surface geometry, you can actually take a line or a series of lines and combine them into a really complex form. Um, so long as you get the top cord and the bottom cord are the same length, you could make all these interesting moving patterns with just a series of lines. And um, so we were, um, right around this time that I was doing this, we were asked to uh, participate in a competition. <clears throat> it was a design build, contractor led design build competition for a $53 million transit hub in Seattle. And um, I thought that was great. So we made all these renderings based on this idea and our contractor um, and design team loved it and the client loved it and we won the competition. 
now the contractor freaked out. You know, it's like, how are we going to build this for, you know, can we build it for the $53 million? And I started to show him that it was just really a series of lines that we would do. And so we work with them, we work with the fabricators on developing the, uh, the technology to kind of do this. At the same time, I was thinking again of the, the idea of movement, but uh, this is my colleague at USC, William Forsyth, who's a very well-known choreographer, and he would do these improvisational pieces um, that he called lines in space, and so he would make space with with lines of light, and you know, I started to think, can I make space with lines too? And so we wrote some scripts and just started making all these drawings uh, based on lines. Um, and so uh, in the end, we wrote our own um, scripts and such to uh, rationalize the geometry and figure out um, how to construct this. So this was one of our first uh, passes at it based on our competition entry. Um, and you can see this graph. If that, was, if that was good, it would be like a flat line, meaning every piece would be the same. You can see there's almost zero, you, zero pieces that are the same. Um, but we worked, you can see that line flattening out um, to become more cost effective, more buildable. There's a, over 8,000 pieces that we would do. What you know, I failed to take into account during the competition was that our facade is 65 feet tall and nothing is going to efficiently span 65 feet. So the, the, once you put an intermediate cord in the equation, ruled surface geometry goes out the window. And so it became a whole nother exercise of balancing the support cords and the lines um, on that. So I'm just showing you again some of our drawings. These, um, uh, we wound up doing direct fabrication from our drawings. Um, and so these are just some of those where we rationalize all the geometry around the building. These would be, the software would be sent to the uh, subs. They would roll the forms and this is how they would come to the site and you know they would go up. It all went up pretty well. Some of them needed a little muscle to get in there but by and large it, it, it worked. And then the skin or the lines, this is what I thought we would do. You know we would just go buy some stock shapes. That didn't work well either. Um, you know nothing would would span. So we started to kind of try and uh, make uh, an extrusion that would do all the work. So something that was efficient materially, that was efficient to span. It's like this whole process is a bit like playing Jenga. You know, you keep removing things till it's barely standing. And so when we would change one thing, we would have to change everything. So I'm just showing you the evolution of that extrusion to where we got to the most efficient uh, piece that met our design concept or criteria. And there it is. Um, there they're testing it for torsion and other uh, uh, properties in the lab. And that's our happy contractor with all 8,000 pieces getting ready to be shipped. Um, it was put up by um, four people on two cherry pickers in about 14 days. And so you can see, um, you know, this is a very large building um, with this kind of flowing skin that connects to the plaza and the light rail station. I actually... And again, this kind of, this is the main uh, area out of the structure to the plaza with the light that kind of streams through that and then the subterranean parking. And I always love, I, I love showing these, you know, our clients in the end who like try to kill you during the process, then they come out when it's all done so happy. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to close out here with shifting gears on something that um, that I think is really important uh, for us as a society. Um, I've also found I prepared two lectures tonight um, because I couldn't decide what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I remember while I was doing it, I was a remember at it. There was a time where I would work so hard to just get enough material to talk for an hour. Um, so maybe you'll invite me back sometime and I'll talk about uh, in more detail what I'm going to give you just a taste of. Um, you know, it's, it's homelessness or housing. And um, it's become a real big issue for our society. And we've, we've been doing it for a long time. Um, but really, one in seven people live below the poverty line. Um, and it's, you know, what's so disturbing about it is that it's not like homeless people that you see on the street, it's people who are working. So we have a whole class of what's become the working poor. And I think we have to find um, housing solutions to this to make housing more affordable. We have a particular problem in LA that um, we have, um, you know, we have 55,000 homeless people in LA. Um, that's like a whole city because our housing is so expensive as part of it. We have the lowest vacancy rate in the entire country and, you know, it's just not affordable. Um, so we're doing, you know, we're doing a lot of projects that are uh, to try and do our part to um, help that. This is a, a 53 unit housing project for disabled veterans. Um, and um, it's not only houses people and it has a lot of the kind of design things that I talked about, but it, it also has um, a lot of the performative portion. It's a lead platinum building. Um, all of the projects we pretty much do are lead platinum. But does anyone know what a, a EUI is? Anyone in this room? Okay, a couple people. Okay, for all you students there, you better learn it because that's going to be the future. Okay, building energy uh, usage is, is becoming going to be part of that crisis. Um, this building uses, as you can see, like half of the energy of, an, of a building of its type. Um, and it's also... 153 units per acre. So to give you an idea, New York City, the average is 252 units per acre. So we have to build denser so we can get more housing. But, um, you know, it has a whole passive and active sustainable strategy that makes it efficient. But also the big thing for us is that, you know, it becomes part of the community. You know, you want people to have privacy but you want them to be part of the community. And you know what we've done here is, is to, I don't like the courtyards when they're, wall, you know, the handrail on the second floor becomes like a wall. So we use them to kind of step down with these planters so that when you're actually on the deck, you don't see any wall. It just opens directly to the community. And so you get these courtyards which are private, but they, um, they connect to the space. Um, and we help them uh, get original artwork on loan for their project. And um, so it's, it's a really quite beautiful place. This is all for uh, disabled veterans. And you know, you get a small but really pleasant um, environment. What we also have learned too is that windows that are long and skinny that go from floor to ceiling feel a whole lot bigger than the same area of window done horizontally. So um, another one that's under construction, mixed use 60 unit building in North Hollywood, a similar idea where the common space kind of leaks out to the public realm. 
and one in Venice. Uh, this is 55 units um, with the same idea. And Santa Monica, this is a true artist loft, so artists will live here. This is all done, uh, proposed to do with CLT, the whole facade. And, um, you know, what's the crisis in LA has become so astute that um, the, um, everyone's trying to do something about it. So the, the, our, the voters in this past election, we uh, approved by a 70% margin uh, almost a billion and a half dollars to go towards trying to house the homeless or do something about homelessness. And as a result, late last year, the county came out with this uh, competition um, and the city just announced a similar one like this. Um, they're gonna get, give away $4.5 million to someone who can come up with solutions, scalable solutions to fight homelessness. So we entered in it and about two weeks ago, we, uh, we found this. So now we're um, working on this kind of challenge, like can we make uh, scalable, affordable, sustainable housing? And um, my idea when we, we entered this was to try to do something like that. You know, part of our problem is in LA is we have a schism between what the voters are saying and what's actually happening. So we're approving money to find solutions, but nothing's getting built. Um, and part of it has to do with building departments, council people, there's a whole array of things which bog it down. So, you know, I thought if you could make housing like an RV where you just drive it onto the lot and um, you're, you have instant housing and you just hook up to utilities, you know, that's kind of what we were thinking and that's kind of what we designed. But I, I wanted to have a little bit more charm, you know, maybe uh, like that. Um, so we came up with this idea, which, which we call the Nest Design Toolkit. And this was really weird for me or odd for me to suppress myself from being the designer because our idea was not really to design it, but to provide a toolkit for design. And so we, um, one thing we did, which the, they really liked is we analyzed the whole um, Los Angeles region and 80% of the lots in LA are 50 by 150. Um, but we have many cities within LA and they all have their separate codes and planning codes and building codes. So we went through all of that stuff to figure out what we could design that fit on everything. And so we designed units that would fit in any location on any lot that was 50 by 150. Um, and so we showed that, how that would work. And then we came with this kit of parts. And the, the, it's, I'm not gonna bore you with all the uh, specifics of it, but there are these service units which could be configured into private and public bathrooms, kitchens, and so forth. They have their own power module. We work with some vendors who can make a power module, a water supply, a black water module. So basically we could just go and put them on the site and then we could add on to them later. So there's configurations uh, for uh, sleeping units as well that have the same thing and a kind of technology that allows it to work. And then this is where we basically have the module but we left room on the site so that you could put a facade or skin or exterior however the designer decides to do it. So uh, we simply just showed some configurations of how that might be and site configurations as well um, for that. So I'm going to leave you with um, this short little video that was done which I think kind of explains it better than I can tell you about what's happening in, in LA and our housing issue. 
We've become a culture that ignores people and looks the other way. Our homeless problem, especially in Los Angeles, is so large now that it's almost untenable. Los Angeles has the highest number of unsheltered people anywhere in the country, and clearly you can see that in Skid Row. There's a lot of suffering that goes on. If you're not ready to live in the streets, it gets pretty profound. For those individuals who have been largely isolated and alone, beginning to try to build the system. I've known Mike for a long time, and this is really our first um, collaboration. The name of this project is The Six that we did for Mike, and that means that, in military terms, it means I've got your back. And really, Mike is The Six for homeless people. I think I was one of the first people who moved, who had keys, and I thought I, I, thought I was dreaming. And I came and looked, it was empty. I was like, who else is this? They said, yours. I got a radio, a microwave, a crock pot. What more can you ask for? They have everything contained in their own unit, but then we have my breath away. Because I've been suffering for a number of years. Suffering for years. And uh, what are you going to expect, you know? Breaking stereotypes of the homeless goes back to design. It says something. It says we care about you. Design definitely can empower individual. If you ask Mike, he'll tell you that good design is part of the healing. A little bit like Frank Sinatra, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. No one has a bigger homeless crisis than we do here in Skid Row. I think it's absolutely a replicable model. All you need is the will to do it. These are our cities. Whatever we make here, whatever buildings we build here, they're part of the larger fabric that defines our cities. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the lecture. It was really inspiring. Um, going back to the first part, just because I prepared a question for that, uh, I noticed an interesting contradiction almost because you, you sort of gradually um, transition from speaking about architecture as a sculptor um, almost to like, architecture as um, algorithmic design without even really mentioning the transition. So you, uh, in your later projects, scripting seem to play a larger and larger role as a way for you just to explore an initial idea and seeing how it would unfold. Um, but in a superficial way, that seems almost like a massive contradiction that you talked about at first of just exploring accidents. Um, do you see a contradiction there, or how do you see that? Uh, probably, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, my, I, my, my partner is my wife, too, and she often complains. She says, can't we do at least, you know, the same thing twice, you know, and I think, I don't, I think if you're not moving or changing, you're going backwards, and so it's really a journey, it's not a static thing, you know, I showed you some things from early in my career, and like, I changed, um, you know, if I showed you the stuff that I did in school, you would, you'd probably fall down, you know, so, I think, you know, a career in architecture evolves. And, uh, you know, I always, I always said I would not plagiarize myself, although I find myself doing that too. Um, but I, oh, I try to be open, you know, and find, uh, find, you know, learn something, I guess. And so if that's a contradiction, then, yeah, and I suppose it would be. I hope that answers your question. I would just say don't, you know, like I explained early on with Harvey Fight, you know, he 
was doing something that he thought was the right thing and wound up somewhere completely different. And I think it's okay to do that. You know, some, you know, I'm not that good where I know what I'm doing and I just keep doing it until I become great at it. You know, for me, I'm always searching. And maybe that's part of the contradiction. Well, ironically, design build is a, is a great method to keep exploring because if you do design build and you partner with the right people, whatever scale it is, you can constantly evolve your project. You know, it allows you to do that even on very big projects. Um, it's disastrous when you're partnered with people who are, you know, not of the like mind. Um, you know, what, um, unfortunately, there's very little architect-led design build. It's probably 99.9% .9 contractor-led design build. The only people who were doing it with architecture design, led design build, are people like Jonathan Siegel, who's doing like his own work. You know, and he's his own client. But like in the public realm, it almost doesn't exist. Um, you know, so it's harder, you know, and when we don't do it, I've learned some tricks uh, to get around it. You know, like there are a lot of things we do do a public bid, like they go out for the low bid. And so we, in our, you know, in our, uh, proposals, you know, we always get questioned about our reimbursable number. Why is your reimbursable number so high? You know, well, we have in there, you know, it's usually for printing and things like that. We have full scale mock ups in our reimbursables, you know, so we wind up making things during that process too and working with, with people who build things um, to make them. So a lot of the big scale things, we are flushing it out as we're doing it. Um, you know, so yeah, it is harder and that's like a challenge, you know, I don't want to be the guy who just does these little idiosyncratic things. I'd like to, I want to, you know, work in the public realm, but I, and, you know, can I do it? I think so. You know, I just need more opportunity to do so. Hi, Larry. Um, uh, I really appreciate the stuff that you showed at the beginning. Um, it's really amazingly beautiful, inventive, um, and personally inspiring to, to take uh, extraordinary, uh, ordinary things and elevate them to the extraordinary. Um, but since you, you brought up the, the homeless stuff at the end, I think we have to kind of talk about it a little bit. And um, uh, I, I, I really, um, I'm always questioning myself about what the real agency of architects um, and architecture in general is in um, something uh, crisis that, that large. Um, and is, is our role really just to design things that are more inventive and cheaper so that contractors no, and no. developers can do them cheaper? Yeah. Or how much of it is really like a policy issue? Because if, if, if they didn't have that vote in LA for the $1.5 billion, none of this could right. happen. So wh where do we really ground ourselves as architects with consciences um, uh, and not just uh, uh, service industry uh, people. Yeah, that, that's my other lecture I prepared tonight. I was this close from doing it. Um, you know, I, I would, we, I founded two nonprofits myself. I've done a lot of policy work. We've actually, uh, you know, we've made changes to policy and it's, 
It ha you can do more with policy than you can with anything you design. You know, but at the same time, pol I, what I found is policy is not permanent either. And I have a whole deal that I could show you. But yeah, we are, we need to be part, we can, we can be. And like we've been parts of movements where we've been stewards for good things. Like I think the whole sustainability thing was started by architects in a way. And we, you know, we tend to, we embraced it, but I think we can do more. And I think everyone, everyone likes things better when they feel they're contributing, you know, and that's just universal. That's the way we are. So I think we have a role in that. But, you know, again, unlike when I went to school, um, you know, we were taught that you do everything. And today, it's the profession so big, you can be good at one thing, like computational stuff or uh, construction technology or materials. So we need, we, in some ways, we need specialists that work together. And I mean, we would have a whole new, it would open up where we're one of the few professions that are still, you know, like trying to do everything. So I hope that answers it. I could keep going, but I don't want to keep everyone here. <laughs> That's in my other lecture. <laughs> I just couldn't put it all in one hour, I'm sorry. You know, uh, but it's, uh, yet yeah, you're correct, that is a problem. And there are solutions, but there, you know, what I would say, you know, so I don't keep you here, if you look up the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute, it's now run, run by Enterprise, which is something that I founded 10 years ago. Um, with the idea that we would do it once, and now we're on our 10th year, you know, and we're teaching uh, developers <clears throat> how to be stewards and, and what are the benefits, and we publish books and proceedings and all these things, and we bring experts to, to show, you know, by and large, people who do affordable housing, it's like a specialty, you know, in some ways. And I got into it early in my career for actually a very selfish reason, you know, like I would look at these affordable housing projects and go, God, it couldn't be more ugly, you know, like I can do way better than that, you know, and then when I started to do it, it's so hard, you know, for all of those reasons. Um, and so, you know, the people who do it are good people. They're just mired in that same thing and they don't know. And so with our institute, we've been able to show them the path and it's amazing, you know, what's kind of happening with these. So I'm hoping that we're, you know, we've worked with now over 50 um, nonprofit and community developers and they're changing how they think. So, you know, hopefully in, 10 years or 20 years, all that really starts to take hold. But it, it, it is changing. I mean, if you're looking like, you know, the Michael Maltzen is now, you know, people want to do, like, good designers want to do affordable housing work, and um, they're, they're all over. It's becoming, it's, uh, people want to do it now. So I think it's going to get better. And those issues, yes, are issues that we can be part of the solution. We're not the solution. Okay, this has been a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.